This Monday, tragedy struck Quebec City. A gunman opened fire on a mosque, killing six and wounding 19 men. My heart goes out to the people affected by this tragedy. I hope you see justice done and find peace. I remember learning about the tragedy in Quebec City and seeing all the narrative peddling that sprung up almost immediately afterwards and thinking, six people are dead. What kind of individual hears that and immediately starts asking themselves, how can this benefit my belief system? The first draft of this was written before the tragedy in Quebec City. It features a somewhat scathing indictment of Puritanism based on ethnicity or race and how it cannibalizes national spirit. Ironic, since apparently the gunman was far right and anti-immigration, at least when it comes to Quebec nationalism. Now, I still expect immigrants to love the country they immigrate to. The liberal expectation of opening your arms to even those who loathe what you stand for is also cannibalizing the national spirit. Anyway, I wanted to get a word about this tragedy in before men's rights activists get blamed for the shooting, and we will, because why not? If a man does something bad in the name of an ideology, of course the people who oppose defining men by how they serve ideologies are to blame. And speaking of men serving ideologies, let's get on with finding out why our world is going to shit. Legitimacy of authority can come in two flavors. The first is inspiration, inspiring people with a sense of shared purpose, a unified destiny, a great work. The second is using conflict in order to legitimize your rulership. It's the oldest trick in the book, and it works like this. You incite a conflict between Team Blue and Team Red, and then you swoop in, and with your great wisdom and beneficence, you solve the conflict you incited in the first place. And because you are able to resolve the conflict, you are able to justify your rulership over both. Yay! When a society goes from being governed by inspiration and shared purpose, maybe the moment we go from electing someone we admire to electing the lesser of two evils. Ultimately, it doesn't matter the conflict, just as long as the population is invested in it. In fact, the ruling body will simply shape the conflict to whatever social and technological features up there exist of the time. Tribal conflicts, ethnic conflicts, and now this relatively new idea spawned by mass media, ideological conflicts. The ultimate point is to keep the people invested in the conflict so the government can swoop in and resolve it, thus maintaining its authority over its whole population. Realize this. Our conflicts, the conflicts of the plebeians, do not benefit us. They benefit the lawmakers. They benefit the religious hierarchy. They benefit the bureaucrats. They benefit the tax collectors. They benefit the tyrants. They do not benefit us. In fact, they are the means by which we are ruled. Our conflicts are our cage and our shackles. The discerning viewer may have already recognized something familiar here. Yep. The American government uses ideological conflict to justify itself. Well, every government does. We need the conservative man and the liberal man to always be at each other's throats so the government can incite, contain, and resolve the conflict in a ritual display. Since liberal and conservative men can't resolve their own ideological conflicts, the government will do it for them. That process legitimizes the government and government control over all of us. And now, this age-old trick and its mass media ideological twist has encountered the internet with a completely different set of social rules. The real conflict now is between people invested in online media as a source of information and people still invested in old media and their online presence as authoritative. The powers that be have noticed this new potential source of conflict and have already moved to exploit it for legitimacy. Notice how things have polarized. Old media is left, new media is right. The powers that be have managed to transplant their old ideological conflict onto this new battleground. Or maybe it's just human nature. Who knows? The battle between Trump and Hillary was less a battle between right and left and more a battle between old and new media. The powers that be are trying to lock up the power of the internet by reframing the debate between new and old as left and right. The right wing talks about obscenity, the left wing talks about objectification, the right wing talks about the war on children, the left wing talks about the war on women. And now we have an old left-wing press and a new right-wing press. And what happened to just the press? Have we just given up on that notion? Journalistic ethics, neutrality, research. Is that where we're at? There's only two sources of information, both of which are ideological. 
Fake news is a symptom of this polarization of the narrative, plus the increasingly divisive influence on, of online puritanical communities. These separate online communities will grab up any scrap that proves their worldview and will race, race it like wildfire through their ranks, no matter how false or absurd, because they do not check their facts. Here's an example. A true alternative media starts by scraping out an audience on the cheapest platform possible. Plagued with technical difficulties, it slowly and painfully grows, suffering continual setbacks, slowly scraping together an audience. It does not start with a technical staff, a fully equipped studio, millions of dollars of revenue, and gain an audience in the hundreds and thousands or the millions almost overnight. Understanding that, consider how truly alternative what we label alternative is. I'll come back to this point and clarify it later on. And one of the main problems with transplanting that old manufactured ideological conflict is that this new social media, this new social media battlefield intensifies it beyond anything in history. The new rules of social media. One, the backfire effect. Studies into partisan psychology show that being told facts contrary to your viewpoint can serve to harden your attachment to it. On social media, we are in near constant contact with people who believe things we do not so, and thus are throwing facts at us, do not accord with our belief systems. In the process, our belief systems are hardened ever more, and our ideological divisions become far more stark. Two, the effortless purge. Due to the ease of purging unbelievers, all that's required now is a banner, a block, not a bullet. Communities can go through successive waves of purges, each creating a more purified social consensus. Three, social consensus junk food. Because you can spend your time among people who think in ways absolutely identical to you, social media exploits the instinct to adhere to social consensus more thoroughly than any other media in history. This makes it addictive to people with a high desire to conform to social consensus and increases the power of social consensus to force people to conform. Four, brighter lights create dark darker shadows. Existing in an online community with people who think exactly like you do leads to very little positive social contact with people who don't, assisting in the process of demonization with anyone who doesn't believe as you do. As the us becomes more and more narrowly defined, the them becomes more evil. You get lazy. Number five. Living in a bath of people who think exactly like you allows your compromise and reason muscles to atrophy. You get lazy and defensive about your choice to be essentially stupid. In combination with the addictiveness of high-grade social media consensus, you can easily simp slip into self-righteousness in the face pace of people who think differently. Seeing them as a devil for doing so is much easier than exercising your flabby reasoning muscles to move your fat-ass opinion. Six. You hate too easily. Polarizing opinions give us a way to filter through all the potential contacts possible online and rapidly sort them into us versus them. The sheer amount of people on the internet may make this a necessary thing so that some people avoid going insane. We're only really meant to be able to keep track of about 250 people, and now we have to deal with the pressure of potential contact with millions and millions. Seven, you get a constant exposure to the victim, to the, the people that your ideology has identified as the victim constant exposure to their pain and suffering. Outrage culture. All of these features lead to the rise of super Puritan communities, something never before seen or dealt with in terms of historical conflict resolution. National pride, patriotism brings a country together. It inspires love and brothership in its citizens. It is a true leadership because it's a shared purpose. It's a shared social consensus. By definition, a shared social consensus between people who think differently and are different. Different beliefs, different political ideologies, different ethnicities, different races. Ever since the Sabine and Roman tribe laid down their arms and joined in a common purpose, nationalism has been a triumph of diversity. And it's dying. It's dying because it can't compete. It can't compete with the purified social consensus possible on the internet, a consensus created by hundreds of thousands of people thinking absolute lockstep and purging themselves of anyone with the slightest difference. To consensus-based thinkers, their online world is more real than the real world, and in the real world, they are triggered by anything but the most absolute agreement of the online world. How do you generate a sense of shared purpose between these communities laboring under an impenetrably powerful social consensus created by social media? And it's not just the left, it's happening on the right as well. 
tying national spirit to race or ethnicity or even place of birth means that certain groups cannot take part in loving what America stands for, or Canada, or England. There can be no coming together when the lines are drawn based on geography or genealogy rather than nationality. Prior to this age, we could rely on community, family, a sense of shared purpose to quell the conflict, not just the government's ritual combat between two parties. Now we have none of that, just more and more people addicted to the kind of absolute social consensus that can only be found on the internet. The powers that be are playing with fire. They are now inciting a conflict that they likely cannot contain, and we will all eventually be burnt. What I'm seeing is Republicans proposing laws to control super Puritan behavior on the left, even calling for censorship or violence. Same thing on the other side. None of this will recreate a sense of shared purpose, and without a shared purpose, you're stuck with conflict resolution of escalating levels of severity, tyrannical laws, draconian police action, martial law. Consider that the more violent this ideological conflict, the more authoritarian your government is justified in becoming to resolve it. Always ask, who benefits most from this conflict? Who incited it? Who keeps pouring gasoline on the fire? And even more importantly, what is the anatomy of this conflict? How is it created? How is it maintained? How do we get rid of it? So let's go there. Let's look at where the conflict comes from. There's a historical corner case that illuminates how you can manipulate identity to create a class of people who aren't legally owned, can own property, even be appointed president, well, vizier, and yet still be slaves. Slaves that can be trusted to run an empire for their masters. The historical case was during the Ottoman Empire. The group was called the Janissaries, and they proved you can manipulate a man's identity, turn him into the perfect slave. The kind of slave so enslaved you can hand him the reins of your empire, and all he'll do is run it for your benefit. What the Ottoman Turks did is this. They would go to Slavic countries and steal the sons of Christian slaves. They would then force march them hundreds of miles back to the heart of the Ottoman Empire. Seven ten-year-old boys force marched, starved to death in ditches, dropped dead of exhaustion, and those that survived would be brainwashed into believing in Islam. Not only could these Janissaries be relied upon to do much of the work to run the empire that stole them in the first place, but they effectively ruled it and went back to the Christian communities they came from and could be relied upon to put down insurrections by murdering their former kin. Essentially, this process manipulated the Janissary sense of self. The excised Christian self, the younger Christian self, was immoral, impure, degraded, and also weak and constantly at war with a new identity as a Muslim. That war created a creature investing in, invested in proving himself worthy by service to the pure, the born Muslims. In turn, the native-born Ottoman Turks fought bitter competitions with each other, but when they were challenged as a group, they came together to defend their pure, shared identity. This manipulation of identity created one class of Muslim that served and another class with an internally consistent identity that was served. When you wound a child's sense of self, they will spend the rest of their lives trying to stitch, stitch themselves back together, wound them in the right way, and they will spend their lives stitching together an empire. The Ottoman Empire created a slave class they could invest the running of their entire society to, and it lasted longer than most empires. The Janissaries are ultimate and stave slave craft. No society has superseded the Ottoman Empire in their ability to manipulate identity to compel service. Until now. Most people don't know, but man was originally completely gender neutral. In fact, its gender neutral aspect wasn't even considered controversial until feminists started to complain in the late 20th century. The original term for adult human male was wereman. It may have come from the Latin ver, as in virtue and virility, both of which orig originally referred to the manliness of a man. Like the Janissaries, men occupy a shaky position identity-wise. This is obvious when you look at terms like be a man or real man. The male identity is conditional on service. It took me a long time to figure out the cognitive logic as to why where men disappeared. Woo, as in woman, designates the gender-neutral man as female. 
Still, and it still denotes to this day a legitimate occupation or value. Women give birth, they raise children, they manage the home. Where, as in Wehrman, stopped denoting a legitimate occupation or value in about the 11th to 13th centuries. Suspiciously, this occurred only in cultures where a virgin birth, mythos, and the devil rod introduced sin to the act of conception. Thus, man is simply someone who does the prefix. Without a prefix, man is worthless. However, there may be an invisible implication to man, which is person who needs to do something to earn value, which explains the real man and be a man rhetoric whenever a person wants someone to do, wants a man to do something to serve their interests. And that's why Warren Farrell, as Warren Farrell observes, men are replaced with occupations to humanize them and to get people to give a shit. People care when they hear 100 firefighters died or 100 miners are trapped, but when they hear 100 men killed, they don't care. Perhaps they even think, if those men didn't have occupations to make them worth anything, they were just a drain on society. We should throw a party. A hundred leeches are dead. Women are very much gender specific because their use and value is gender specific. Women can be firemen, policemen, statesmen, X-men because they can, in addition to their woo value, earn additional occupational value. But they can't be men because they can't lose the value of their woo prefix. It was modern feminists who became disgusted with the idea that man was the generic because they misunderstood that what men actually stood for. Feminists do this a great deal. They can read female victimhood into anything, including a linguistic trick that deprives men of any innate worth for being adult human males. It means, man means, person who takes their value from their prefix and applies equally to males and females. It's just that females can't have their prefix taken away because they were born with it. And the reason why man is now associated with adult males is because they're the only ones in society who earn an identity through service and have nothing of value through birth. Interestingly enough, the loss of wearmen coincides with the rise of two traditions, chivalry and courtly love. Courtly love is a knight chastely worshipful of his lady. And of course, chivalry in includes, even from the beginning, a great deal of service, consideration, and protection of women. Now, what happens when you remove a Janissary's childhood Christian identity and brainwash him into Islam? What happens when he's taught to regard Islam as pure? What happens when he comes to regard his own people as a threat to that purity? He becomes an impure Muslim. And that sense of impurity makes him a driven man with a secret self-loathing and something to prove. He becomes a man who goes back to his own men, Men he no longer recognizes as human because they're outside of his ideology and slaughters them. What happens when you remove wearmen? What happens when boys are taught to regard girls as pure? What happens when boys are taught that they are dangers to girls' purity? What does a boy become? He becomes a man who goes to other men, men he no longer re recognizes as human because they're outside of his ideology and slaughters them. The more men and boys are shamed, the more they have to prove. The more they have to prove, the bigger the ideological conflict. The bigger the ideological conflict, the more legitimacy our collective governments get in resolving it. Billions of dollars are poured into campaigns to teach men and boys that they are the single biggest threat to the one thing they are taught to save, that they are impure, unlovable, deplorable, debased, over and over again, whipped by shame for being male. It's a perfect system. You shame men into slaying monsters by telling them they are the monster that needs to be slain. And all this suffering just to pit men against each other so our governments can justify themselves by pulling them apart. Of course, the downside to all this is that those men who act out this ideological conflict, through, or those men who act out the ideological conflict through violence. But that's just collateral damage for the government and media and academia. It's all collateral damage for the powers that be. How ironic that the only group that's calling the powers that be out for their bullshits, gory harvest, us, men's rights activists, are the one group inevitably, point, inevitably have fingers pointed at them to be blamed for it. Conservative and liberal men need each other, but they are never going to work together as long as they need to serve fight the shame and as long as they need to be a hero to save the damsel as long as they need each other to play the villain the bigger the villain the bigger the hero the more and more it goes it grows
grows and grows and grows. Not only will they not work together, but the force multiplier of social media means that they are rapidly losing the ability to regard each other as human at all. And social media allows for absolute purity of thought, a shining beacon of complete social consensus for social consensus-based thinkers. And the shadows grow darker and the battles more pitched. How the fuck did this happen? We are a self-domesticating species. We manage to find all sorts of bizarre and outlandish equilibriums with no apparent conscious effort. It might be entirely possible for us to have arrived at this place without any intent whatsoever. However, there is the possibility that this was intentional. Consider the role feminism plays in all this in maintaining the conflict by shaming men. Shame that spurs them into fighting each other for a positive identity as hero. Generating the ideological conflict whose resolution is the defining feature that legitimizes our so-called democracy our so-called free society. When the, when the story broke that I had once been, that I have for four years been a central intelligence agent, I was demonstrating outside the Pentagon underneath Mr. McNamara's office against bombing in Vietnam. And uh, this didn't precisely fit with the image of a CIA agent, but then neither does the CIA. Just saying. Now, here be the thing. Remember when I said how alternative is our alternative media? And I explained how a true alternative would struggle to find an audience? I'm sure a few of you said, well, Allison, that's rather self-serving. Maybe Honey Badger Radio is just a slightly shit. Well, you might be right. Don't ascribe to malice that which is adequately explained by you being slightly shit. However, there's more than just that in determining what is and is not alternative. Do the media sources we currently label alternative exploit the same dynamic of that of the government? Do they exploit men's need for an identity by giving them a villain to slay and a damsel to save? Do they exploit junk gender roles? Do they women worst and trot out female victims using a group of women, any group of women, and then go ballistic when you ask them to prove their X is greater than Y assertion? If they do, they're not alternative. Just like Wendy's isn't really an alternative to McDonald's, it's selling the same thing. It's exploiting the same instincts for fat and sugar. It's not an alternative, it's just a less popular version of fast food. Likewise, there are also just more or less popular ways to exploit men's need to serve an ideology in the wake of being stripped of an identity. There are just more or less popular ways of selling junk gender roles. Now, why should you care? Because no matter what your ideology is, you are going to fail. The only winner here is the House. It's not the left. It's not the right. It's not conservatives. It's not liberals. It's not libertarians. It's not even feminists. The only winner at the end of the day is whoever's in it for power and power alone. Now, let's set aside arguing about socialized medicine. Let's set aside roads, schools, taxes, family values, civil rights, immigration. Let's set aside all of our fights that those who crave power are only too happy to use against us. Let's think for a moment how much the government spends on inciting, containing, and resolving the ideological conflicts fracturing our society. Imagine how much more financially efficient the government could be without this ideological gridlock plaguing its operations. When we talk about reducing government spending and control, this is the place to start. Because I think we can all agree, it's shit to be made the butt of a joke. And we are all the butt of this joke. And it's even more shit to be taxed in order to be made the butt of the joke. If you're a minarchist, you need to start asking why we have these ideological conflicts. If you're a libertarian, you need to ask how much does it cost to sustain this conflict? If you're a socialist, ask yourself what the government could be spending on besides this. If you're a liberal, consider how much government, how much the government is sacrificing of our well-being and our civil rights to force us into the conflict. If you're a conservative, this conflict is the one thing that will destroy the fragile order created by national pride and patriotic spirit. If you're pro-family, consider that big box feminism has torn families apart by demonizing men until you fight back against the pro propaganda labeling men as the biggest threat to women. Any pro-family platform will die, stillborn. If you're a Trump supporter, if Trump is the anti-establishment candidate, he would be all for this because it will crack the establishment wide open. If you're a feminist, hear this. Big box feminism has ultimately created two gender roles, men who do and women who are done to. At least men are slaves in this system. Women are made even less by it. 
Women are made into chains and shackles. If you're a gamer gator, stay tuned because you're going to discover why the media had a two year hysterical meltdown over what was basically a tiny, insignificant, minuscule scandal that should have been resolved in a day. And if you're a men's rights activist or issues advocate, if you're a member of the most humble of civil rights movements, working quietly away in dusty, underfunded, out of the way offices, only ever paid attention to by the media to belittle for being weak and ineffective or demonized as secretly dominating all of society, oh, ignored by the government, scoffed at by academia, prepare to be amazed because you had the answer all along. So pull up a chair, grab some popcorn, and enjoy the show as we watch all the usual suspects blame each other for circling the drain because they're circling the drain as they circle the drain. And maybe, just maybe, we might be able to stop everything from being sucked under. If you're worried about this, don't. The media hysteria around Gamergate and men's rights has exposed their hand, exposed the unguarded exhaust shaft of their fully armed and operational Death Star. The Rebel Alliance has a target and a game plan. And if that doesn't pan out, what can I say? Listenators, unfold your folding chairs, grab your beers, and practice your condescending Willy Wonka face because I just pulled the media's pants down. And they sort of lose that self-righteous cachet when the con act is exposed. Now we get to watch them running around with their ass hanging out, shouting about how looking at it is hate speech. Step right up. Step right up. It's the radio station at the end of the world. Enjoy your front row seats to the shit show. And dreadfully sorry about the spoilers. They really can't be helped. Welcome to the after show. In the previous episode, I mentioned that someone had sent me a Trudeau candle. And I said I hoped. Well, I don't know if I said I hoped, but, you know, I was pondering whether or not I would also get a Trump candle. And lo and behold, I did indeed get a Trump candle. And the individual who sent this is right here. Dear Badger Cave, I was the one that sent the Trudeau candle, exclamation point. It was to set the mood for writing that lacy green Trudeau elbow erotica. Per your request, expect to see a great, great candle show up soon. Love at tibarminds.com. This is this is the Trump candle indeed, and uh, ugh, it's repulsive. Um, and, and this is nothing toward Trump, but this smell is really bothers me. Um, let's see, let's read it. Uh, the Trump scented candle combines notes of tanning lotion, steak, and the color orange to produce one of the classiest scents of all time. Many people are saying it's the greatest candle ever. Believe me, believe me. Now that you own this candle, you are going to finally start winning again. You will do so much winning that you will get tired of winning. You might even want to stop winning, but you won't be able to. You will just keep winning, winning, winning until you literally fall on your knees and beg for success to relent. It will not. This, this candle is not affiliated with or endorsed by Trump. In any way, if somehow that was not already obvious. You know, I, I imagine that he probably has a better sense of humor than you guys think he does. Anyway, thank you to the anonymous person from Las Vegas who sent this all in, uh, Tibber. If you want to send me something bizarre or a letter, then what have you, send it to Badger Cave, care of Allison Tiemann, 113 First Avenue West, Kelvin, Saskatchewan, Canada, S0A1W0. And I want to thank all of our supporters. I now have a halfway decent setup for video. Unfortunately, solving the audio problems will be a hell of a lot more complex. At minimum, we'll need to be able to afford professional grade internet, which can cost upwards of 80K for five years for my location. Sound technicians to create a specialized setup that compensates for our decentralized situation, as well as some pretty pricey equipment. We are working towards this goal, but my first priority is making sure that the people who do this work get a living, a living income from it. If our audio problems persist, the show just has audio problems. If we lose people, we lose the show entirely. This show is about multiple perspectives, not just one. Libertarian, liberal, left-wing, right-wing, anarchist, monarchist, 
monarchist, minarchist, men's rights activists and whatever feminists will lower themselves to speak with us unspeakable deplorables. We're trying to, what we're trying to do creates more, requires more than one voice. You can't resolve ideological gridlock without learning how to share a common purpose, even while disagreeing. If we lose dissenting voices, we lose the soul of Honey Badger Radio. So if you're interested in helping out, the only place on the internet that advocates for every position being heard and every position being subject to intellectual rigor, please go to www.patreon.com slash honeybadgerradio. Do you disagree with us? That's exactly why you should support us.